Isabel. Yes. <laughs> we are going around academic institutions asking clever people what they think <laughs> about our idea of uh, putting a research station on the Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to ask you, because I know you do a lot of marine research and freshwater research, uh, what do you think of the idea? Do you think the Sunshine Coast is a good place? I think it's a fantastic convinced? place. Absolutely fantastic place. Um, generally in BC we don't have enough field stations to start with yeah. and I think field education particularly for biology is crucially important mm -hmm. um, and we don't have enough particularly closer to the big centers mm -hmm. uh, Vancouver in particular mm -hmm. um, so that field station really you know so accessible to um, to the big city mm -hmm. is um, I mean it's a, it's a great idea yeah and the Sunshine Coast itself has got an amazing myriad of different aquatic environments and everything from alpine wetlands to intertidal estuaries, all sorts of the interface between mm -hmm. freshwater and marine as well. Yeah, which that's right. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously more interested in what goes on underwater. Yeah. Uh, but I know that even, even the location of pods is one of these really interesting locations where you've got a variety of different underwater habitats um, and it, pods would be such a fabulous jumping point to be able to study, you know, within really close proximity uh, everything that ranges from, you know, soft bottom habitats to seagrass to uh, rocky reef habitats. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really yeah. a great, great location. Because I know you're very, you're a serious scuba diver, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to reinstate the scuba diving course that yes. used to be at Capilano College. And That's right. From, uh, in memory of our great friend Jim Rossi, and uh, so we're going to provide all the equipment and the boats and everything to help more people learn about diving. Yeah. But yeah. so it will be, uh, you know, it, I think it's a good spot for having a diving school as well. Definitely, yeah. definitely. But, yeah. That's again that's uh, a really really exciting development yeah. and uh, it's um, you know I do a lot of dive training sort of in the Vancouver area particularly mm. up Burrard in the Indian Arm where the diversity of organisms is really really low mm -hmm. uh, and you really need to get out into yeah. uh, the strait. Yeah. And, and further up to start getting into really good areas where people can be exposed to a yeah. much, much broader range of uh, organisms. And to be honest, it's a, it's a lot easier to start and maintain monitoring programs uh, when you have a good base to do it from. Mm -hmm. And a field station is a fantastic base uh, to yeah. do that. So uh, all along the sun Sunshine Coast, and to be honest, until pretty much you get to the uh, central coast, uh, there just aren't the kinds of facilities right now mm -hmm. to serve as yeah. monitoring base. Like because, that. because we also realize you can't just do it with one of these places. So we're mm -hmm. building pods and developing it on the basis that it will act as a model for That's other right. stations right. that we can go yeah. all the way up the coast. Right. Another really important thing is that actually a lot of NGOs who you know, worry about monitoring the marine environments are realizing is that um, as monitoring programs kind of develop organically without a whole mm -hmm. lot of communication, you know, either between field stations or between uh, NGOs, you end up with data sets that aren't compatible mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah. So if we could create in BC the kind of program where these uh, these these monitoring efforts are not just growing organically, but are growing in a coordinated manner. Yeah. You uh, you end up with you know a product yeah. that that is extremely extremely valuable. Yeah. In terms of your research and the kinds of things you might do in, mm -hmm. I, mean, I know you've been working with kelp beds and urchins and all those mm -hmm. things. But what mm -hmm. else do you think we might be able to? What would be in your mind, uh, an important thing. To yeah, um, obviously we're we're into invasive species as yeah. well. So we've yeah. been doing some work on uh, the green crab, the European green crab, right. and trying to understand uh, their distribution, the, their current mm. and future distribution. Yeah. Um, 
So that would be certainly um, a strong interest of ours to start yeah. monitoring um, green crabs. Um, but there are also a number of other invasives that come usually associated with marinas and that are transported yeah. by recreational boats. Yeah. Um, so you know, un unfortunately, everywhere you have a marina, you pretend you have a, yeah. a potential haven for invasive species. Yeah. And actually, understanding how these invasive species can make the jump from these uh, man-made habitats like marinas yeah. to uh, natural habitats yeah. is yeah. Uh, something really really important yeah. Yeah. Um, so so I could anticipate mm -hmm. you know doing that kind yeah. of uh, research we've also been quite opportunistic um, mm. so taking advantage of things that happen that nobody's predicting such as the mass yeah. mortality of uh, sea stars yes. yeah. right? which um, we we were fortunate uh, when that well fortunately <laughs> when that happened here and that yeah. we already had uh, a bit of monitoring data from before the mortality so it was pretty easy for us to right. repeat that right. but if you start you know monitoring certain sites repeatedly so yeah. establish then permanent you, quadrats or permanent yeah. transects then you're in a really really good position to understand uh, yeah. the impacts of these major unpredictable events yeah. uh, that might occur. So we yeah. may or may never again get another mm -hmm. uh, sea star mortality you yeah. know, like we did a few years ago. But undoubtedly with climate change and everything that's going on mm -hmm. uh, in the environment, we will get other things, other yeah. major disturbances. So most of our sound stuff so far has been done um, in the tropics, yeah. uh, but I'm developing some plans right now to look at how the um, the recovery of otters oh. is affecting the soundscape. So we're we're planning on uh, doing underwater recordings if we can get the money. Uh, doing right. underwater recordings uh, in areas where otters have come back, right. and where they're at different densities, and areas where otters have not yet returned. Oh. To see, because otters obviously have a whole lot of impacts on the on invertebrates, urchins yeah. in particular, right. um, and they may well inadvertently be changing the soundscape um, oh. of right. uh, what goes yeah. on. Not necessarily because there's no urchins, but because there's no urchins, they may be fewer other invertebrates, or perhaps more other invertebrates as yeah. kelp grows right. back. Right. Yeah. So, so. Who knows? It's it's possible that the ocean becomes a, a little bit noisier, yes. naturally noisier. Oh, when, right. That's uh, interesting. It's natural. I was always imagining it would be boat noise. It would be no, uh, no, no. There's there's some natural noises wow. that are produced, for example, by invertebrates that become r really important cues for, for example, little fish that are looking for a good place to settle. Oh, right. Um, so they'll hear this sound, and at least in the tropic. The tropics, the fish hear the sound and they can actually distinguish between good quality and bad quality habitat just based on the sound. Really? And uh, wow. so you get more recruitment, you get more little fish and invertebrates arriving mm -hmm. in those places where the sound is just wow. right and fewer and where the sound is not right. I'm not going to ask and, you how uh, you discovered that. <laughs> well, that, that wasn't actually my discovery, but I sort of built right. on that yeah. and, for example, looked at the impact of an invasive. Yeah fish on the soundscape right. Right. of habitats and we've actually discovered, this is a discovery of ours, yeah. Yeah. that uh, these invasive fish are actually changing right. the soundscape wow. of the habitats they've invaded. Yeah. I knew a guy in England who studied the sounds that fish make, perch actually, right. and he yeah. used to go out at night mm -hmm. in his boat yeah. and record perch yeah. noises. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I mean, is the, not, the noise on no. the water is unbelievable, yeah. especially no. at night. What we'd like to know is, kind of in a nutshell, I mean, what do you think about, how would you describe pods and what we're doing? Because you, kind of, you know a lot about what we're doing, so how would you describe yeah. it? I think it's a fantastic initiative, not just from the research perspective, which is obviously the, the, the part that I would use, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think as a... Um, as an outreach tool, as an education tool, yeah. um, I think the uh, the architecture that is provo proposed is absolutely wonderful. I can just imagine being on a boat and yeah. approaching Pender Harbor and then seeing these yeah. wonderful 
structure and I mean everybody who comes by boat is immediately going to go what is this I have to go investigate this yeah. and so I think that you know the, the attractiveness yeah. of the place is going to be just amazing but the, the scope really the scope for discovery the, the scope for making people uh, realize the richness of the environments not, not just the marine environments but everything that's in the area is uh, is tremendous brilliant <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> you're, you're very kind that's <laughs>